I'm pleased now to introduce Rick Cooper, who is service lead for talking therapies at Vitamines. Rick is also one of the directors of the psychological therapies in primary care health integration team. Uh, so now, Rick, over to you to talk through your projects. Thanks. Hi, thanks, Holly. Um, I'm waiting for my, uh, the first slide of my PowerPoint. Um, oh, there we go. So basically, this is a project that, that we did with the HIT. Um, I think um, David Kessler's here as well, hopefully. So do, do feel free to chip in, David, if you've got anything to add. But um, basically, we did this project. Hi. Um, so we, we did the project with um, the previous IAP service, which was Bristol Wellbeing Therapy Service, which was um, an, uh, an AWP service. And basically, we were trying to sort of look at access for people from BAME communities. And um, we were the, the reason behind the project was um, to do with the fact that there's quite a lot of evidence to show that people from those communities don't access IAP services as successfully as other populations. And and when they do access them, the recovery and the, the, the efficacy of the service is generally poorer than for other groups of people. Um, and so there's a few stats here. 16% of people in Bristol are from BAME backgrounds going to the 2011 census. And I think the other thing that I was, you know, particularly kind of concerned by is that when people do from BAME backgrounds do access services, they're, they're quite often seen at the, you know, at the point of crisis. So they're quite often seen at the very hard end of services. Um, so more kind of acute mental health services and, um, and um, forensic services and things. And I suppose IAPS is a service, which is a very preventative service. And it seems really important that people access IAPS um, before they develop very really severe problems. So that was another kind of um, reason for trying to target people from that background. And another thing which we were trying to look at as well in this in this project was to do with the fact that people um, generally coming to IAPT quite often don't have a very clear idea about what's on offer. And um, so people, you know, who do phone up and self-refer, sometimes they're not very clear about what IAPT actually offers. And uh, so part of part of what we were trying to do was sort of really give people a really good idea of what's on offer for them so they can make a good choice of what they would like. Um, can I have the next slide? So this is something I found on the YouGov website, which is sort of a bit of corroboration really for, for the reason for why projects like this are important. Um, so it's about, you know, the importance of trying to go out into communities and trying to engage communities, um, particularly from uh, hard to reach groups and uh, kind of take the service out to them really. Um, can I have the next one, please? Um, so, what we did was basically we developed some information sessions and um, we de designed um, we designed them as a sort of PowerPoint presentation. So they were run as sort of two hour sessions that were run at the same time every day um, at Junction 3 in Easton, which we chose as a sort of area with a very high BAME population. Um, and, and there's a library there, which is a very nice sort of space for people. And we ran them there and we developed the PowerPoint using some service user feedback. We had a service user forum of people that had recently used the IAP service. And we, we took the PowerPoint to them, the one we'd originally developed, and they kind of tore it to shreds really and said they didn't really understand it and gave us some really useful feedback. And on the basis of that feedback, we kind of tried to create a PowerPoint presentation that was kind of very easy to understand and gave a clear idea of what's on offer um, through IAP and what you can offer access quickly and what might take more time to access and the different things that we can kind of offer people. And um, it was particularly, we were thinking of it particularly as an initiative to reach out to those communities. Um, and next slide, that's okay. Um, so we actually ran the sessions and what we did before running them um, was we went out into, um, kind of community venues, barber shops, um, places of worship, shops along the Stapleton Road. And we tried to advertise, because we, we were really trying to sort of advertise to people, not from trying to get people coming from kind of non-medicalized settings and from settings within their own community. So we kind of took some advice from agencies that work in that area and they suggested that would be a good way to advertise. 
and that was how we did it. So we, we spent some time um, with people going out and putting flyers and posters up, advertising the sessions. And like I say, they were run at the same time um, every week on the same day. So there's a bit of consistency about where they were going to be. And uh, they were staffed with them. Um, we had some members of staff that had worked uh, quite a lot in that area of Bristol, who'd been working. Um, they'd worked for Nilari, who are an agency that uh, do a lot of work in that area. And they basically were very keen to get involved in this. So they were staffing the sessions for us. And um, so, they, like I said, the two, they're two hours long. They consisted of a presentation about what's on offer and then a, a sort of bit of time to talk about and discuss the offer and also some support around um, what might be the best option for people. So being able to actually talk to people about, you know, is, do, would a kind of an easy access, low mood course be the best option? Or do you need to come in and have an assessment and, you know, and uh, we can find out a little bit more about what's going on. And also there's a lot of form filling in IAPT. We get people to fill in forms every time we see them. So the other idea was that we could kind of help people with the um, with the form filling. We could sit down with them and sort of help them fill in the forms and overcome any barriers around that. And if they've got any questions about, you know, what the forms are for or the meaning of them, we could help explain that. Um, and the next slide. Um, and basically, this is a little bit of data we managed to get. Unfortunately, we ran these sessions between, um, it was a sort of autumn of 2018 up to the um, end of the summer of 2019, at which point we were recommissioned as a service. Um, and at that point, we lost access to quite a lot of the data that we had because unfortunately, um, or fortunately, have you look at it, um, we were recommissioned and, and basically a different service won the tender. So all the data we had at that point was sort of archived but I've managed to get some data from the CCG or through the CCG from our analyst, our data analyst who works for us now. And it, this is data that's BNSSG wide. So it's huge numbers of people really. Um, and it doesn't show a lot of um, effect. Um, but um, if I could have the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, there's not a lot of effect, and partly because you know the, the number of people attending the sessions was relatively small in the scheme of the thousands of referrals that, that came into the service over that period. But you know, we kind of we, we would argue that it's um, it's still an important piece of work, and it's still an important thing to to try to develop more. I think because uh, it's partly reaching out to the people in in underserved areas of the community, and I guess it's partly be able to have a chance to really explain what's on offer to people in terms that they understand and give people a way into the service that doesn't involve and you know a lot of our referrals are online referrals or people that phone up and then get a phone appointment booked and to try and give people a kind of point of access to the service within their own community that's more hands-on and a bit more meaningful seems like a, a very important thing to do um and i guess the other bit of information which is you know I, I came across is that people from BME backgrounds you know have had higher levels of depression and anxiety through the COVID-19 lockdown and as well as lower levels of happiness and satisfaction that's from a quite recent study and I think this kind of work is more important than ever really at this point and in fact I could have the last slide um, so we extended the sessions at the time a little bit um, we, we ran some sessions in care homes for older adults who are a demographic of people that we don't access enough at all um, at the moment. Um, and we also piloted it, a few of the sessions with students at the University of Bristol. I mean, at the moment, obviously running these sessions face to face is not an option for us. And I think part of what would be really interesting to think about is whether we can try and run them in some sort of digital formats, particularly for students and overseas students and people like that, that might be quite isolated. And I think the other thing I'd really like to do in the future is if we're going to develop this is to, is to have the information sessions in partnership with other agencies. So kind of employment services and debt support and, and other um, services we work closely with so that there's a sort of one-stop shop for people to be able to come and find out what's on offer for them within their own community. 
Um, and yeah, that's that's it from me. I don't know if you've got anything to add, David. Sorry, trying to unmute there. Um, no, I think that's a really clear presentation. I mean, if you if you go back to the data slide, the table, it's just worth commenting that the you know these these large numbers of referrals over five thousand per quarter are not going to be significantly impacted by a tiny number of people. I mean, I'm not saying it was a it was it was a meaningful number of people because I think it's I'm sort of proud of this work that Rick and colleagues have done and I think it's really excellent. But it's a relatively speaking a drop in the ocean compared to all the IAPT referrals. But I think it's a really good model. And I'm particularly supportive of the the one-stop shop model, which I think will be incredibly helpful to all sorts of people in getting them the right sort of help, the right uh, and timely help, uh, rather than just being funneled into IAPT. So uh, I hope we can, I hope we can continue with this, with, with this work, with this as a pilot, I think it's worth saying. Wonderful, yeah, and thank you very much both for, for describing that so clearly, That's that's been really helpful. I think some of those themes are gonna be picked up by our next speaker. I just want to make a quick note about questions for the speakers. So as I said, we'll be asking questions for Rick, Katie and Sabitha all together. Um, if you could pop the questions into the chat, that would be great. We're seeing a few popping up now. I'll be reading the questions out uh, to people in case anyone's concerned that they might pop up on the screen in front of everyone. Um, I'll be happy to, to read the question out, but it'd be great to, to have more questions coming in. Thank you. So thanks very much, Rick, and thank you, David. Welcome. So now I'm really pleased to introduce Sabitha Bakarathan, who is here with us today in her freelance development officer role with the Dimension Action, Dementia Action Alliance. And I think we've got a really interesting, quite complimentary project to hear about now. Thanks, Sabitha. Thank you very much. So I'm Sabitha Bakarathan, and I have quite a few different roles, but I'm going to focus on a piece of work that I did um, particularly over 2016, 2017, when I was actually working as a research associate at the University of the West of England. And that was a piece of work specifically to learn about dementia experiences of people from communities in Bristol, of Caribbean, Chinese and South Asian communities in Bristol. So how this work developed, over the course of 2015, very much spearheaded by Rosa Hui, who's the director of Bristol and Avon Chinese Women's Group. She was a member, or she, and she still is, a member of the all-party parliamentary group on dementia. And being involved at that national level, obviously also made her reflect on the local picture. And she wanted to know what was happening around dementia, specifically for BAME communities in Bristol. She posed the question at a timely moment because um, the Bristol Dementia Wellbeing Service, which is a partnership between Devon Partnership, NHS Trust and the Alzheimer's Society, a very innovative new partnership, was just about sort of to come into being, having been commissioned. Um, and kind of the answer that was coming back was that not much was known around dementia experiences of people of BAME communities, and there appeared to be very low numbers of diagnosis and very little take up of relevant services. A working group came together to discuss this and they managed to secure a small piece of funding from Bristol City Council's public health um, department, that's the, the, the public health part of Bristol City Council, for an eight month study into this that would be led by um, University of the West of England. The out of the working group developed a, a small core who became a steering group from the project. And I really want to focus on that as one of the strengths of the work. It was a cross sector steering group. So we had representation there from the Alzheimer's Society, University of the West of England, um, and BAME led voluntary community sector organizations. So for example, Rosa then became the chair of the group and Andalouris Chacon, I don't know whether anyone was here yesterday for the opening event um, of this conference. Um, Angela Chacon spoke there. She's the manager of Bristol Black Carers. So really 
strong focus steering group that, that crossed sectors. And I was employed um, as, a, as the researcher on the project. And I'd like to focus on that with that bit without wanting it to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but kind of taking myself out of the picture, um, a strength of the projects that there was funding for someone to come into post for an eight to nine month period. So a very short period of time. And I, they, they took a chance on me, the University of West of England employed me and I came along with no academic research experience at all. But what I did have was since, since the year 2000, all my time has been spent as an activist in the volunteering community sector in Bristol, a lot of the time with the AME led organizations, um, sometimes in paid roles, a lot of the time in unpaid roles. So I was very known by many of the organizations whom I was then going to be going out to, to try and recruit participants for this qualitative research study. With the support of my supervisor at UWE and Professor Rick Cheston, who's the head of dementia studies at UWE, I was able to get the, the training quickly to, to, um, to learn more about academic research. But what you can't learn quickly and what you can't develop quickly are, that, are those contacts in, say, voluntary community sector organisations who you're going to be going out to to, to seek to um, run focus groups through or seek people for one to one interviews. So I think that's another strength of this research study. I think another strength is that straight away we discussed as a steering group that in this short period of time with a part time worker trying to find out about dementia experiences of BAME communities in Bristol was vast. And I was really worried it was in danger of becoming very tokenistic, very superficial. I was also worried it would then be kind of a tick box exercise. Oh, well, we've done BAME and dementia in Bristol. And I was very adamant that I wasn't going to have my name associated with a study like that. So we decided to be much more authentic, much more focused. We were up front and said, because of this short period of time, we're going to focus on three communities because that's what we thought the time allowed us. And we were evidence based in our approach. So I looked at census figures, which albeit were out of date in the 2011 census. But from that, um, we selected three communities. Um, so the three largest BAME communities in Bristol with um, the largest aging populations because age is still the greatest risk factor for dementia. So that um, covered Caribbean and South Asian communities. The, the Chinese community in Bristol currently isn't one of the largest BAME communities and it doesn't have the largest number of BAME older people. However, hearing from people of Chinese origins on the topic of dementia and also mental health, which is often aligned with dementia, is something that's very rarely been done nationally and certainly not locally. And having Rosa as our chair, as a massive partner in this, meant this it was a golden opportunity we didn't want to miss being able to make contact with people from Chinese communities and hearing of their, their stories and their views on dementia. So I think that's another strength, that our third strength that we focused on three communities and we were very upfront about why we did this. So I've mentioned it was qualitative research study. So I set about trying to recruit people um, either for one-to-one -one interviews. So in a very flexible way, so whether it was meeting people in the evenings meeting in venues that they selected, um, meeting at weekends. There was that flexibility in what I offered and also wanted to run focus groups. And the way I went about running those was with partners whom I was already known with, as I said. So for example, um, some focus groups in partnership with Dekbar, which is a South Asian led voluntary sector organization that particularly provides services for older people, some with Bristol Navy and Chinese Women's Group, and one at Golden Ages, which is a social group, particularly for Caribbean older people in Eastern. So it was very much in partnership. We offered funds, say towards room hire, to make sure that we recognize that partnership. It wasn't just taking from them. And we also obviously offered um, to pay the cost for interpreters where that was needed. At a midpoint review, uh, my supervising professor, Rick Cheston and I um, looked at everyone I had, the groups I'd heard from so far, and we noticed there was a real gap at that point. And one of the gaps, for example, was hearing from Caribbean men, particularly older Caribbean men, but of any ages. 
and so we decided that you know we were lucky lucky because of the the funding we had from public health we could be a, maybe a bit more flexible than we could be if we'd had say funding from the nhs around the ethics protocols but we um went about trying to hear more informally from those groups so i spent a considerable num amount of time in various barber shops in the eastern st paul's area but i did my my background research first i, I bike everywhere so i biked around a lot and got a sense of where men from different BAME communities, which barbershops they particularly wanted to, and then I targeted where I went. But I didn't just go in once and try and hear from people. I de developed a relationship, so I went to one particular barbershop around three times. And the way I got people speaking with me and sharing experiences, whether it was in the formal focus groups or the more informal settings, say barbershops, or I spent some time in a mahjong group, to hear from people of Chinese origins was not going straight in and using the word dementia, but trying to um, get a sense of the different ways that dementia maybe gets described in different languages. So it doesn't directly translate. And I think it, I, I felt it was a waste of time and still do to try and translate dementia into Punjabi, but it was more giving some of the common symptoms or characteristics or behaviors around dementia and saying, if my uncle behaved like this, how, how might you describe him? Or if you're feeling this, how might you describe that? And I sort of have this ongoing lexicon in about eight different languages of how dementia kind of behaviors might be described in languages um, such as Arabic or Punjabi or Cantonese. And then using those terms, getting people to talk to me um, in focus groups or one-to-one -one interviews or informally. Um, some I need to keep an eye on the time. Um, I'll fast forward a bit to tell you some of the outcomes of the research study, which I would like to say I felt incredibly privileged to do the stories that people shared with me and the time they gave me and the places they allowed me to spend time alongside them was really amazing. Some of the, the best paid work time of my life. Um, some of the outcomes include the fact that we um, published our study in February 2017 and we had real support from the mayor Marvin and his team at City Hall and we had an event there to launch the, the research study and we made sure we invited all the participants to come along to that. So you know, it was a really kind of glam location and we brought up our own food then. It was a way of really tangibly wanting to thank people who contributed to the research. We've since had a, um, an, an academic article published in the journal Dementia that came out last year. And we also have a short film, which is so our, our study is available and the film is available on the Bristol Health Partners website under the Dementia Hit research um, web page. Um, Bristol Aging Better funded us to make a short film. It's about eight minutes, which I, I think a lot of people have used as a training resource, which really is um, an evocative, vivid um, illustration of the research study. And something I'm particularly proud of, a working group came out of the study. I was very adamant it wasn't just going to be another study on a shelf. 18 recommendations form part of the study and the working group came together, again, cross sector. And it, um, we're, we've widened it to cover BNSG, so Bristol North Somerset, South Gloucestershire. And we're trying to work without any funds to make the recommendations into actions. What we have achieved today is some small projects that we've accessed some funds for that helped us meet some of the recommendations. So while I was still at UWE, I was made redundant from there in 2018. But while I was still there, I reckon I managed to access some funds where I ran information sessions in GP surgeries in Bristol, in targeted GP surgeries that have high numbers of patients of BAME origins. I think that's an important action because I was very concerned that other research studies quite often um, put the focus on BAME communities. We stigmatize dementia. We need to be more open about it. We need to access services. And why that is definitely true, and there's ongoing work we need to do about that. There's also another element of people of BAME origin sharing with me that they had gone to the GP, but maybe because they don't use um, terms like, my, I have memory loss, 
that they may be not being listened to. So an important part was also speak, meeting with people who are as part of the diagnosis pathway or service providers to getting them to also reflect on the services that they're providing and how they listen and how they diagnose, for example. And last year as a freelancer um, under Bristol Dementia Action Alliance, I accessed some funds from Bristol Community Health and I ran um, a very enjoyable project, hard, um, but enjoyable project working in partnership with faith communities, particularly with Bristol Sikh Gurdwaras, the Hindu temple, some black led churches and some mosques where I ran dementia awareness sessions. And I was as agile as I could be with those um, running sessions at the end of kind of the Sunday worship times at Gurdwaras, but also sort of being available to go along and run information stalls at other times. Um, and I would like to say as well, um, I think uh, something that's really validating about the research study is Bristol Dementia Wellbeing Service, who've been a real partner in this, the work of their community development coordinators has really responded to the recommendations in the report. So the way that their team now works is really continuing trying to um, kind of focus on the recommendations as well as all the other work that Bristol Dementia Wellbeing Service has to do in their own business plans but they've really taken that on board and it makes me think of like um, early work I did in neighbourhood renewal in Bristol in 2002 when we talked about something called bending the spend trying to make um, kind of mainstream service providers really take into account what communities are asking for and, and change the way they spend it feels to me like another example of bending the spend if that wasn't too too much jargon um, thank you very much for listening and I look forward to being able to respond to any questions later. Super, thank you very much Sabitha, that's really great, sort of really good insight into that specific project but also I think some really good issues that all health integration teams should be thinking about when they, when they go out to different communities to work together, so thank you. Wonderful. I think what we'll do now is uh, take some of the questions that we've had in. There's, there's still time to put questions in if you'd like to, so, so please go ahead and do that. Um, what we will do after we've had the questions, we have one final video to tee up our breakout discussions. Um, so I think we'll probably move to our discussions at about 10 to 3, so we've got a bit of time now for questions. So looking at what we've had in already, I think there's been quite a lot of interest around this concept of a one-stop shop in community settings. So what I thought would be helpful to do is if we start with Rick and David maybe expanding a little bit on what suggestions you have for how that might work and then to get some reflections from Sabitha on experiences through your project here and other work on, on how that might land. So we'll start first with Rick, thanks. Hi, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a very interesting um, model to try to run. Um, and it's quite interesting because at the moment we're, we're even though we're working across BNSSG, there's a lot of work going on in localities. And there's a couple of meetings I've been involved with in South Bristol, where they're, they're, they've got a thing called um, an independent care partnership that they're developing. And this is one of the things that's being kind of suggested there is that there could be hubs for people to go and kind of access support from, if that makes sense. And I think the GPs are quite interested in it and it could kind of sit in front of the GPs in a way so that people are kind of able to come and access services like ours and sort of the more kind of psychosocial elements of, of services in the voluntary sector and things. And uh, I suppose part of the challenge of it is if we were going to do it, which I think it, I think it would be a great idea, where, you know, where do you locate them geographically? You know, where are the places that really need them? And in South Bristol, they seem to feel like this is a model they're very keen to, mm. to go with. Yeah, I mean, Emma Juras has uh, said, I'd like to hear more about what and who that might involve. And that challenge to Rick and myself to produce something a little bit more concrete than a pipe dream is, uh, is welcome, although this is a slightly embarrassing place to uh, explore it. I think this does... We don't really know, in other words, it's a short answer how we're going to do this, but we know we need to engage other, other helping agencies because Rick and I have had numerous conversations with feeling that just pushing people into psychological therapy isn't always what they need right then. And it's about a timely intervention. I think we're not saying that when you're depressed, you don't need 
CBT when you're anxious. You don't need CBT. We're saying that you might need something else first. And we want to be, want to have something a bit more streamlined. GPs, I'm a GP and have been since 1990. So I think I know what I'm talking about. And GPs don't really have the time and the capacity to do this work. Uh, and so we think it would be a, a something that we, you know, we want to try and build on. And, and, and where to do it? I think well, we started thinking about BAME communities because, because of the outreach. And I don't see any reason why we shouldn't try it there. But we need to get people like Nalari working with us. And, help. Yeah, and, and I think people like, you know, debt support. I would quite like to get some people in from employment yeah. services because yeah. I think they're going to be very big issues coming up in the near future. And at the moment, 20% of the people that come into up the IAP service are signposted, for want of a better way of putting it, into these sorts of agencies. Okay. And put, you know, there's probably better Thanks. ways to do that, I think, in terms of, you know, right. having a, one, a single point of access for everything. That's really, really helpful. I wonder if this point, Katie, I might bring you in to get your reflections as, as a service user and, and that sort of concept of going to a community setting to get this sort of support. How, how does that sit with you? Uh, I think it I think it just goes back to that point that I made in the video about talking to other people. I think, um, yeah, I think that's already something that, that's happening. I think it, it works for different people, doesn't it? So, my point. Yeah, thank you. That, that's really helpful. And then Sabitha, what would you have to say to this sort of forming early idea um, around sort of going out to community settings for being a one-stop shop for access to some services? As you can imagine, I'd be flying the flag for it. And I, I do think, and I don't want to um, kind of lower spirits about it, but I think, I mean, Bristol's such a huge city and I, I always, I find it quite help, helpful to think of it as lots of different villages. Um, I, and when I first came to Bristol, I was working in early years around race equality and I would go and do um, training in more of the peripheries of Bristol. And I would have, and this is sort of days of short start and so on. And I would have people saying to me, oh, we don't really have to worry about this training because we don't have any of you here. And that was, yeah, you know, people of colour. Um, well, we're only having to do it because Ofsted are making us kind of comments. And, you know, that doesn't feel that long ago to me. And um, hopefully uh, things have come on more now and definitely um, BAME populations in Bristol are more dispersed. People have tended to think that we're all around Easton and St Paul's and that's the end of it. And you know, there's a growing Somali community, for example, in the Lot Lees area. So I think looking at one place for a one-stop shop would be quite a challenge. I, I mentioned Bristol Dementia Wellbeing Service. They sort of have three, three or four clusters, I think of where they're based um, to make their services more accessible. And I think that's been a, a real um, a strength of how Bristol Dementia Wellbeing Service has worked in Bristol and been a change of how dementia services were in the past. Um, but there's certainly enough community venues and, and how um, the, the, you know, the response to COVID, community hubs, community anchors develop. So there's Wellspring, um, over in the Lawrence Hill area where I work part time, we've got South Mead Development Trust, and West Health Park. You know, they're there, ripe and ready for partnerships such as that, and they've got the premises. So, yeah, I think maybe not one, but several. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. And it looks like an idea that's generating quite a lot of interest across the hits. So we can continue to explore that. And that sort of mention of COVID, I think, would lead us on to probably our, our final question, which, which is directed towards you, Katie, from Stephen, which is about whether anything's changed helpfully for you during the COVID situation, if there's any learning that you think we might cherish. Um, I think this is when it would be nice if there were more public contributors here to answer that question. Um, I think probably that uh, for a lot of people, actually accessing mental health services like remotely on the telephone um or being able to have some online I mean because something you know I didn't say was that the my mental health services went to being um on Skype mainly um and actually for lots of people I think that'll be really helpful to help them actually access services so I think it's that getting back to that balance isn't it with um when face-to-face -face is needed but also helping people access 
you know, when perhaps for people that can't get out of their houses because of physical disabilities or um, to do with their mental health. So hopefully it will mean that more people can access support. Thanks, Katie. That's really helpful. Well, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And thank you very much, speakers. I'd normally be inviting you all to, to clap at this point, but please do give a, a virtual clap for all our speakers. We've, we've really appreciated that. So thank you. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to now just have a final um, bit of input from an external colleague. So Adwa Weber, unfortunately, can't be here today, but she's put together a video which I think gives us some helpful reminders about what we're talking about when we think of health inequalities and also some local work that we can connect with. So Adwa Weber is the Head of Clinical Effectiveness at the CCG, and it'd be great to have her video now. Thanks. My name is Adwell Weber and I work for Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire Clinical Commissioning Group um, and my role there is Head of Clinical Effectiveness. So just for those of you who don't know what a Clinical Commissioning Group or CCG is, our role is um, to help improve the health and well-being of the people who live in Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire and we're also responsible for planning and sort of buying health and care services for the population. So that's what we do as a clinical commissioning group. And I've been asked just to give a little bit of an update about what the system is doing in terms of health inequalities. So just to be, just to make sure everyone's on the same page with this and understands what we mean by health inequalities, the definition that I like um, is that health inequalities are unjust and avoidable differences in people's health across a population and between population groups. So it's important to understand that they're unjust and, they're un 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 and that they're avoidable. Um, they don't happen randomly or by chance, and they are usually socially determined by circumstances that are beyond an individual's control. So this isn't about it being somebody's fault. Um, this is usually social circumstances that sort of conspire to, to, to say that they have a worse um, experience and outcomes of health and care services than some other people. As you're probably aware from the news, etc., you know, we know that they existed before COVID happened, and unfortunately, they still exist. But this particular health and care system, so in Bristol, North Somerset, and South Gloucestershire, there is a renewed focus about what we can do about that. So it's really important to understand that we've sort of redoubled our efforts to try and to, to try and address those. Um, so one of the things we've done is that we are pulling together a population health prevention and inequalities group, and that group will be made up of the three directors of public health from each of our local authorities um, representatives from each of our providers in the first instance, but the membership may change over the time. And the role of that group is to sort of set the strategic direction for our health and care system so that everybody sort of knows where they're heading. One of the other responsibilities that they're going to have is to make sure that in this sort of trying to get services back up and running and trying to sort of recover and learn that we do that in an inclusive way so we know that the way that we had to respond to covid in the, in the sort of very early days meant that we probably took our eye off the ball and we may have made things worse for some people so part of the job of this group is to make sure that we're recovering their services and we've had some really helpful guidance from nhs england and nhs improvement to help us to do that some clear actions that we're going to do and then one of the other things we, we um, the group is going to do is make sure that um, Bristol, um, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire health and care system has got a clear set of outcomes that it wants to achieve around population health inequalities and prevention. If we've got that clear set of outcomes, it means that we can make sure that we're putting in place actions and we've got programmes and projects in place in order to achieve those. So it's something to hang everything on. So in terms of the hits, um, I think that your role is really, really important. You're doing some fantastic work um, in, uh, in the area of inequalities, actually. And so I would really encourage you to connect with the plans that we have and certainly use Ollie and the team if you've got any questions or you want in more information. We have regular meetings and, and they'll be able to either ask me the question or, or we can feed information through. So I'd really encourage you to use that route. Um, you've got some fantastic experience of co-production. And, and by that, I mean both sort of trying to understand what the problem is from not just the researcher's point of view, but from the people who use services point of view. And I think that's something we could probably learn from in the patch. So um, probably be coming to you, perhaps some of the hits and asking how you've gone about that. And, and that's part of the sharing. So we're really keen 
the needs to be telling us what they're doing. It's really hard to map across such a big geographical area and all the different work that's going on to capture some of that stuff. So I'd encourage you to keep sharing, use Ollie and the team and, and, and make those connections with us. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you've been enjoying the conference.